everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. So last week we spoke about the unsolved case of Jacoba Bubbles Roda and if you haven't seen that I will link it somewhere up here for you. But today we're going to talk about a case that did take place in Africa, just not South Africa. Today we're going to talk about the butcher of Uganda and we have spoken about a butcher before and that was the butcher of Cryfontaine. So if you haven't seen that, I'll also link it somewhere up here for you. But today we are specifically talking about Uganda, particularly about a man called Idi Amin. And if you have heard about that, let me know what you think of him down below. But if you haven't, then let's get into it. Intended for mature audiences only. So Idi Amin was born between 1925 and 1928 in Kaboko, Uganda. He was born to a Kokwa tribe and his mother was a Sangoma, which is a traditional healer. And Idi did not have the best education, but he was very well versed in the Quran. So he knew this book back to front and he could cite anything out of the Quran. But most of the time, Idi would spend his time tending to the animals and just tending to the farm around where he stayed. And as a teenager, Eddie got a job as the person at a hotel who takes your hat and coat. I don't know what they're called, maybe they're like a bellboy or something, but he did that. And while Eddie was at this hotel working, he noticed this British soldier like kind of walking around and everyone would just stare at him and look at this man. And Eddie became obsessed with this British soldier and just the type of power and how he made everyone stop and stare at him. Like Idi wanted that kind of power. So eventually Idi started talking to this British soldier and they actually had a very good friendship going and this British soldier decided that he was going to pull as many strings as he could to try and get Idi into the British army. So in 1946 Idi started as a laundry person in the British army and he was stationed in the Maga Maga barracks and Idi worked really really hard to try and improve his status. After a year Idi was actually promoted to the 21st King's African Rifle Corps and just after they started Started, he was moved to Somalia so they left Uganda to go and station in Somalia and when other officers would talk about Idi they would say that he was very brave he was very courageous he always wanted to make as much of a statement as he could he was bold and something that they always said was that he was very tough and some soldiers said that this was a very admirable thing but some of the other soldiers said that he kind of tethered onto the cruel side not really tough love kind of person but a lot of the men in the army thought that this was a desirable trait so they really did admire Eddie and his work ethic and at the time and still sadly going on there were poachers that were in Somalia and Eddie and his team were stationed there to protect the animals and a lot of people say that when Eddie caught these poachers he was said to be very cruel to them and torture them a little bit and on one hand I'm like oh good you know you're hurting these animals so karma is what it is however I also feel that a lot of these poachers are from very poor and hectic backgrounds and I think that they are not really the people to blame they are obviously people outside who are paying these poachers to do what they do but that's a discussion that's like completely off topic but basically Eddie was very very cruel to the people that he was kind of up against and he had no mercy to any of these people so as a random kind of token of appreciation for what Eddie had done in Somalia when his superiors heard about the work that he did there they invited Eddie to attend and participate and to train in the Scottish band and Eddie loved this he loved playing in the band and he thought that this was a great appreciation for what he had done but when Eddie was around 20 years old he was a man that could not be missed he was around 110 kilograms and about two meters tall and Eddie was a very good boxer he was actually titled Ugandan light heavyweight champion and he was a very good swimmer as well most sources said that Idi was an incredible soldier and not a lot of people could deny that. However, because Idi was so big and so strong, some reports did also say that Idi was not the brightest bulb in the chandelier and Idi would rather use his strength and brute force rather than thinking things out logically and tactfully. In 1952, Idi and his brigade were sent to Kenya to fight the Mau Mau rebellion and Idi and his soldiers really wanted to take these rebels by surprise so they would walk through the jungle in Kenya at night to try and surprise these rebels while they were resting or sleeping and they actually did they did end up defeating these rebels and because of this great success Eddie was promoted to a sergeant in within the army and this was around 1953 
But while in Kenya, Eddie did not only track down these rebels and defeat them, but he also fathered two children while in Kenya. And in total, throughout Eddie's existence, he would go on to father 35 children with five different wives. So another year passed and it was now 1954 and Eddie was sent back to Uganda. And remember he was practicing in the Scottish band as a thank you gift a while ago. Well, when Eddie returned to Uganda, the Queen of England actually was in Uganda at the same time and they played in a band and they played this massive concert for her and he was given a prize and he was awarded the best in the parade. Then in 1957, Eddie initiated a protest against the British government or army at the time where he took some other Ugandan soldiers and they protested in order to get more wages from the British army but the British army did not take too kindly to this at all and he was severely reprimanded for this and I'm not sure if it's linked but eventually Eddie took the intelligence test for the military again and he failed the military intelligence test twice and he was also demoted from playing in the Scottish band and he was only allowed to play for the, for the African Rifle Corp that he was already in. Then in 1959, Eddie did end up passing the military physical exam and he was then invited to serve in the British Army again, but in combat. So once Eddie had passed the physical exam for the army, he was stationed between the border of Kenya and Uganda. And while Eddie was stationed there, there was an intense rivalry going on between two tribes. And this was between the Ugandan Karamoya Gong and the Kenyan Tukana Nomads. And I'm sorry if I butchered that, that was really bad. But there was a rivalry between these two tribes. And just after Eddie had initially arrived at the border, the British soldiers that were already there had lost the battle with the Tucana tribe. And somehow Eddie had managed to initiate peace between these two tribes. And Eddie was then promoted to lieutenant within the army. But later on it came out that Eddie had not actually initiated peace at all between these two tribes. What happened was he actually had threatened the leader of the Tucana tribe that if they had touched the cattle of this other tribe that he would cut off every single man's penis within this tribe and sadly he was not bluffing he did actually follow through on his threat and Eddie would beat the people of both ends of the tribe and he would beat them his men would sexually assault their women it was just a lot of carnage that was happening at the same time and the whole atmosphere within this area was very cruel very tense and both these tribes were just kind of death staring each other that was kind of the vibe that was going on then in 1962 uganda won their independence from great britain and a lot of soldiers that were oppressing the ugandans from actually being promoted within the army had now left so now these ugandans could actually fill the higher ranks and be part of a higher system within the ugandan army and because of Eddie's success with creating peace between these two tribes, the Prime Minister of Uganda at the time, who was Milton Obote, had heard about the success and he promoted Eddie to the Deputy Commander of the Ugandan Army and he was given charge of the 1st Battalion within the army. So in 1965 he was leading this 1st Battalion through Congo and they were there because they wanted to support the nationalists within Congo and also to resist some of the foreign governments that were trying to kind of invade Congo at the time. And this was actually very unsuccessful for Idi because the Congolese mercenaries at the time actually drove Idi and his battalion straight out of the Congo. And later that year in 1965, Idi became entangled in a scandal which involved the smuggling of ivory and gold. So the president of Uganda at the time demanded that there be an investigation into what was happening and who was smuggling these precious items out of Uganda. So because Milton Obote was the prime minister at the time, he then promoted Idi to a general of the army as well as a chief of staff. And he told Eddie to handle the situation. So what Eddie did as a way to handle the situation was he ended up arresting five ministers within the army. And because he arrested these particular five ministers, Milton Abote was able to become or title himself as president of Uganda. And while Milton Abote was basically taking over as president, Idi decided to go to the actual president of Uganda's residence and he himself got on top of the jeep that he was driving, shot a 22 millimeter gun at the house where the president was staying and he literally blew holes into the side of the wall where he was staying. 
But luckily, the president escaped and went into hiding for a couple of years. And then in 1969, he escaped Uganda and went to stay in England. But going back, after Idi shot these holes into the president's house, and now that Moulton Obote was basically the president of Uganda, he now promoted Idi again to the title of Supreme Commander, and he had complete control over the army. And then in 1967, Idi Amin actually enrolled in university where he went to study English and was awarded a doctorate in English from the university. And then in 1969, Idi's leadership within the army was actually tested for the first time. And this was because the Ugandan people started to become upset with how Idi was ruling their country. And this was for very, very good reason. So what happened was Idi would actually get tired of people questioning him or not agreeing with him and if he considered you a rebel or you were being rebellious to anything that Milton Abote or what Idi had said then your entire community would be massacred. Then while Idi was the leader of the army one of his soldiers actually accused him of being in compliance with the assassination attempt of Milton Abote, who was now the president, and Idi was horrified that anyone could accuse him of assassination attempt. So what happened was that this person who accused him miraculously and magically was assassinated himself. And while this was all going down, there was actually tension between Idi and Milton Abote. And the reason for this tension was because Idi was actually recruiting people in a personal capacity so that they could kind of join his way of thinking, and so that Idi's personal following could be even bigger. And it would later come out that Idi actually was responsible for the assassination attempt on Milton. And it was also proven that Idi was responsible for misusing 40 million shillings within the Ugandan operations fund. And in 1970, Idi was fired as the commander and head of the army. And he was actually being sued for the money that he owed the Ugandan military. So hearing all of this, Idi then fled and left to Kampala. And while he was in Kampala, he was sitting and he was seething and he was angry that his friend Milton had now stabbed him in the back. He was so upset that his friend could even do this to him. So he was looking for a way to get back at Milton. And that moment eventually came. And on January 25th, 1971, while Milton Abote was at a Commonwealth summit meeting in Singapore, Idi, with the help of some Rwandan rebels, eventually ended up succeeding at a bloody military coup in Uganda. And now, because there was a coup, Idi now claimed himself to be both the president and the prime minister. So when when Milton heard about this on his plane flight back from Singapore, he decided that he was no longer going to go to Uganda and he ended up staying in Tanzania. So to the outside world, people were actually happy that Milton Abote was no longer the president of Uganda because they were hearing all these terrible things. And yes, Milton probably was the one to give it a slight go ahead, but Idi Amin was the one doing all these terrible things within Uganda. But these Westerners who were so happy that Milton was no longer president only saw one side of Idi, and that was this massive sportsman, this athlete, and this person who loved Britain. But they had no idea how brutal and callous this man could be. So as soon as Idi came into power, he let all of the prisoners of war out, and promised the people of Uganda that there would be an open and free election. But instead of promising this and making these promises actually happen and put them into work, he started on this rampage of giving himself the most random title, such as Lord of all beasts of earth and fishes of the sea. Then in 1972, around August, he decided now that he wanted to change the economy. And he thought that the reason that the economy of Uganda was so bad was because of all the Asians living in Uganda at the time. So even if you were born in Uganda, if you held Ugandan passports, or if you were actually working there legitimately, Idi decided that nope, Asians were the death of this economy and they had to go. So every single Asian had only 90 days to get out of this country. They were only allowed to leave with what they had on their back. Any property or any household items that they had left in Uganda were given freely to Idi's military people and anyone who worked in his military. And Idi also started this massive assassination campaign on anyone who was associated 
with the old British ruling and way of anything. So anyone who wore anything British, British businesses, British clothing was all burnt, destroyed, or people were murdered. British people as well as Jewish people living within Uganda were exiled and told to leave. And in response to what Idi Amin was doing, the British and Israeli government completely cut Uganda off. So now that Uganda was completely cut off, they had to find a way in order to fund their military, weapons, also their people. So what Idi Amin decided to do was he decided to join forces with the Russians as well as the Libyans. So with Russia, he promised the Russian government that he would cut all ties with the West and he would rebel against anything westernized and he would also fight anything westernized. And with the Libyans, Idi promised to convert his entire country to Islam. And Idi decided that any man who served the British army before and who were currently still employed in his army now were to die. So what he did was he took some of the men and he put them in a prison cell and he either decapitated all of them or if he was feeling spicy and different, he put all of his men in a cell and then he put bombs within the cell. Some other soldiers he took down and he beat them with their own rifle butt. Which is completely ironic because Idi Amin got his complete stock from the British army and he admired these people. So Idi tried his hardest to keep the massacre of his people quiet. But obviously these men that were serving in his army had wives, they had children who were living quite close so they knew when their husband did not come back and sadly when the Ugandan people started to figure out that Idi Amin was murdering their own people he went on this massive campaign to kill every single person who questioned him or had any ties to the people who were already being murdered and Idi did not care who he murdered he murdered doctors, lawyers, children teachers and even some foreigners and he ended up murdering almost half a million Ugandans and it gets worse. Idi was not a man to let other people do his dirty work for him. He loved getting his hands dirty. He was a hands-on involved type of man. He would love torturing his victims, he would feed their heads to crocodiles, he would keep their decapitated heads in his freezer and he even dabbled in the art of cannibalism. And Idi did not only stop at murdering his people, he also starved his people. He used a lot of the money that would come in for the country on his military and his troops. So there was not a lot of money going into healthcare, schooling, food for his people. Also, Idi became increasingly paranoid and he was said to have 18,000 people as his bodyguards or security team. So these people would go around killing anyone who was a threat to Idi. They would go around pillaging tribes around the area, using their women, and it was just it was chaos. And it was also said that these bodyguards of Idi would fill up Lake Victoria with 40 to 50 bodies every day. Idi even tried coming for South Africa, so he would try and convince other African countries that they should all connect and come together in order to overthrow the power of South Africa at the time. But we are an African country, so I get it, but I also don't. Idi also believed that he was the head of the Commonwealth and the Queen was, was just there. And he dubbed himself as the head of the Commonwealth, not the Queen. And Idi was not of his right mind at all. He even wanted a Hitler statue or memorial to be in the middle of the Ugandan like city centre kind of thing. But Idi eventually felt that his power was diminishing. A lot of Ugandans were getting angry, they were throwing protests and people were just not liking Idi at all. And what he did was he thought that he would maybe distract his people by saying that there was a Tanzanian war coming on, the Tanzanians wanted to kill them so we have to get all our troops ready for them. And while Idi was lying to his people saying that there was a Tanzanian war coming, there were some people who tried to overthrow Idi Amin. However, it was unsuccessful and now Idi was on a anger rampage and he decided that anyone involved in the attempted assassination of him was to be murdered. This ended up killing another tens of thousands of Ugandans. With no substance, he just decided, oh, you look guilty today. But back to now when Idi was preparing for this Tanzanian war, he put together a large amount of troops and they all marched towards the Tanzanian border and the Tanzanian military was prepared for them. And they actually pushed back these Ugandans very, very far back into their own territory, killing thousands of them. But however, the Tanzanians were getting a lot more territory within Uganda. And even some of the Ugandan people were joining in with the Tanzanians 
to try and overthrow Idi Amin. And of course, this brave, big, built, muscular Idi Amin was never afraid of anything. However, when the Tanzanians came in, him, his wife, and his 35 children eventually fled to Libya, where Gaddafi had given them sanctuary for everything that they have done for him. And while living under Gaddafi's ruling, they lived pretty well. They lived in full-on luxury. However, in 1981, Gaddafi and Idi eventually got into a falling out, and Idi was told to leave Libya. So him and his entire family moved to Saudi Arabia where they kind of lived in poverty. They lived very much from hand to mouth and from handouts from the, the Saudi Arabian government. And in 1988, Idi Amin really tried to get back into Libya but was exiled and no longer welcome. Then on the 16th of August 2003, Idi Amin fell into a coma and he did not wake up. His liver and kidneys were starting to fail as well as his health started to deteriorate and his family decided to switch off the machines and he died in a very compassionate and calming way compared to how he treated his own people. And when Milton Abote had heard about the passing of Idi Amin, he actually said, quote, the greatest brute that an African mother has brought to life. And I think that is pretty much correct. I think Idi Amin was a horrific dictator. The way he went out was not the same courtesy that he gave his own people, which was terrible. And I think was, he was so unnecessary in his killing. But I hope that you were entertained by the story. It is a bit different and not necessarily a crime story, but definitely a lot of crimes were committed within the story. But don't forget to hit that like button and to subscribe and I will see you next week. Bye!